I think there's just so much that you can do when you're able to give ownership in the thing that people are using and building. That's what uh, I think is so powerful about, about Web3. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Guys, we have a fantastic episode for you today with Packy McCormick. Into the frontier, the combination of fun plus money wins. That is the secret recipe for crypto. A lot of themes we touch upon in this book, a few takeaways for you. Number one, we talk about the bull case for Ethereum, also Solana, and Web3. I think Packy has a great lens on this. Number two, why humans are just status monkeys, status-seeking <laughs> monkeys. We talk about that and how it applies to NFTs. Number three, how making money on the internet with friends is the new normal. That's what we're doing here in crypto. And number four, a bonus. We talk a little bit about why Cardano is not going to make it uh, <laughs> in the flaws in that community. Yeah, David, a uh, fun episode with Packy. Mm -hmm. He's a talented writer, great thinker on a number of su uh, subjects. He also came into crypto in 2021 uh, or mm -hmm. re-came into crypto in 2021, which gave him sort of a fresh lens to synthesize and look at everything that's going on. Uh, and we talk a lot about his his journey in 2021 and really insightful. What were some of your thoughts? Yeah, Packy's just such a such a fun guy. It was such a treat just to just to chat with him for for 90 minutes. It, it didn't really feel like a podcast. It felt like just we're hanging out, chatting about crypto, chatting about what he's written. And it's always it's always a treat when we bring on people who can write really, really well, who are, who can make content really, really well, because they have already they have very well formulated thoughts. This is the process of writing. This is the process of podcasting is these thoughts are already well formulated. And now we are just deliberating and discussing them. Uh, and and Packy is he's uh, he's intuitive and intelligent enough to really create some really uh, awesome concepts and ideas of almost about everything that's related to to web3 but also how it relates to almost everything else in the world uh, and so he's bringing a lot of just um, prior knowledge outside knowledge to the world of web3 to help guide his understanding I think I think lizards are, gonna, are really gonna like it we talk a lot about ethereum Solana modular versus monolithic blockchains and, and the different niches that those play out of course we talk about nfts and how nfts and and are making the internet fun again and how that kind of chain is changing the culture of people who pay attention to the internet and how engaging on the internet is fundamentally changing because of web3 we also touch on Jack Dorsey and, and his whole anti web3 narrative and a few other just fantastic topics Overall, just a fun episode. I think you guys are going to be smiling while you listen to this one. Yeah, we talk about the bull, the bull case, but we also end on some of the critiques on the, the bear case for, mm -hmm. for Web3, which is uh, always a good thing to add to a podcast of this type. Guys, we're super excited to bring you this podcast with Packy McCormick. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. Aave is the leading decentralized liquidity protocol, and now Aave V3 is here. Aave V3 has powerful new features to enable you to get the most out of DeFi, including isolation mode, which allows for many more markets to be launched with more exotic collateral types, and also efficiency mode, which allows for higher loan to value ratios, and of course, portals, allowing users to port their Aave position across all of the networks that Aave operates on, like Polygon, Phantom, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Optimism, and Harmony. The beautiful thing about Aave is that it's completely completely open source, decentralized, and governed by its community, enabling a truly bankless future for us all. To get your first crypto collateralized loan, get started at Aave.com. That's A-A-V-E.com. And also check out the Aave Protocol Governance Forums to see what more than 100,000 DAO members are all robbing about at governance.ave.com. MakerDAO is the OG DeFi protocol. The MakerDAO produces DAI, the industry's most battle-tested and resilient stablecoin. Using Maker, you don't need to sell your collateral if you need liquidity. Instead, you can spin up a Maker Vault and use your collateral to mint DAI directly. With Maker, the power to mint new money is in your hands. The Maker protocol is extremely hardened and operated by one of the most experienced DAOs in existence. They've been here since the beginning, they've seen it all, and so you can mint DAI with the assurance that your collateral is safe. Soon, Maker will be present on all chains and L2s, so minting DAI can take place on Oasis.app, Zerion, Zapper, or any other DeFi protocol that you use. Follow Maker on Twitter, at MakerDAO, and learn from the oldest and most resilient DAO in existence. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 50 million monthly active users. Control your digital footprint with built-in privacy and ad blocking. 
Inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the first secure crypto wallet built natively inside of a Web3 crypto browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy. But there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. The Brave wallet is different. Brave wallet is built natively inside the Brave browser, no extension required, which gives the Brave wallet an extra level of security versus other wallets. With the Brave wallet, you can buy, store, send, and swap your crypto assets, and you can even manage your NFTs and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps, all from the security of the best privacy browser on the market. Whether you're new to crypto or a seasoned pro, it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. Hey, Bankless Nation, super excited to dive into this conversation with our guest, Packy McCormick. He's an investor at Not Boring Capital. He's also an advisor to A16Z's Web3 Fund. He's a writer of one of my favorite newsletters, besides Bankless, of course, I've got to say Bankless is number one, called Not Boring. This is business strategy meets technology. And more recently, he's had a big focus on Web3, which I've loved to see. And one thing I think we can promise about this podcast is that it will not be boring because we have the writer of Not Boring, Packy. Welcome to Bankless. How are you doing? Hello, Bankless Nation. Good to be here. Good to be here, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's awesome to have you. Um, I, I think, you know what? Uh, we want to start with sort of your crypto journey. If that's cool, hear a little bit yeah. more about it because um, I've been a, a follower of your newsletter for for a little bit, like on and off. Uh, and then I think I, I really started tracking you when uh, we got introduced. I think somebody from the the Solana team actually introduced us and said, "Hey, yo, do you know Packy McCormick? He's got some questions for you, Ryan, about Ethereum." And I was like, "Cool, I love questions <laughs> about Ethereum." Uh, and uh, I think you know one of your first Telegram messages to me after we got. Re- uh, introduced, you just like laid into some fantastic questions. Like just like, bam, you hit me with the hard ones. Like what's the counter argument to Solana's, uh, or what's the counter to Solana's argument that L2s break composability? You hit me with that one. And then you asked why the TVL, the total locked value on Ethereum has been declining recently. And then you also asked of all the other L1s, which if any, do I think is the biggest threat to Ethereum? And I think at the time, I want to get into your your uh, mind space at the time, but I think at the time you were kind of doing a deep dive on Ethereum and you were doing a deep dive on all of these various uh, Web3 platforms. Can you give us like uh, a sense of, of your journey at the time? So where were you in the crypto journey? Had you been in crypto in the past? Were you taking another uh, deep look? Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so my crypto journey started in, I think, 2013, uh, whenever Union Square Ventures led uh, the round in Coinbase, I read the Fred Wilson blog post. I was currently I was I was at a bank at the time. So as I was going bankless and quitting uh, my job at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, uh, one of the things that I realized is that they didn't realize that Coinbase existed. So if you work at a bank, they track all the things that you trade, you have a 30 day holding period, it's kind of a pain to do anything. Bitcoin, however, they had no idea about. And so I was able to kind of buy uh, buy a bunch of Bitcoin. I think about 38 of them at about $100. And then a couple of months later, I went to Oktoberfest. I quit my job, went to Oktoberfest with some friends. They still work in finance. So uh, we're going out and having a big night. I pretended like I still work in finance and woke up the next morning <laughs> mad at myself for spending all of that money when I was uh, unemployed and about to start working at a startup, making a lot less money. So I sold the 38 Bitcoin for about $150 a coin. Uh, So that was kind of the beginning of my my journey. And because of that, I I, I dabbled a little bit in 2017, but really kind of avoided the space because I I was so mad at myself for for selling too early (laughs) and for paper handsing that trade. Uh, So by the time, I think kind of early in 2021, January 2021 is when I started kind of getting interested in, in crypto and Web3 again. NFTs kind of brought me back in the space and just kind of thinking about what the value chain looks like when you cut out the middleman. Like, you know, there's obviously all of the the kind of like fervor and almost kind of like religious language around cutting out the middleman. But I was like, what does that actually mean? It means that more value accrues to both sides, to the creator and to the consumer. And that's a really powerful thing. And you can build new business models based off of that. So by, I think May is when I wrote about uh, Ethereum and, and when we were introduced. Uh, and so my journey at that point was, you know, Ethereum is my, biggest holding, still my biggest crypto holding. I think my biggest holding of anything at the point, huge, huge fan, but, you know, like to kind of battle test all of these things because my brain is naturally not skeptical. So I like to talk to people who are smarter than me. I I even asked the internet, I got probably a thousand replies on why I shouldn't just put all of my money into Ethereum. Uh, But that that was kind of the context of, of us talking was, 
you know, from you know some of the, some of the biggest Ethereum bulls that that I know, and I think Ben at Solana introduced us that he knows. You know, what are the what are the drawbacks? I always find it interesting for people who come into the space and then take a hiatus for a, long, a while and then come back because their perspectives as like, okay, how has this space developed is always interesting, especially when you you were gone for a, it sounds like a, a decently long time. The difference between one hundred and fifty dollar Bitcoin and the rise of the alt layer ones is a very significant span of time. I actually don't know of anyone who's has like a longer gap in their crypto history than than that. So w when you came back into the space, what were your first impressions about like, oh, how has this space developed? What were the things that really stood out to you as somebody that once paid attention, left, and then came back? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know, Bitcoin is obviously the the OG and is interesting for its own sake and and all of those types of things. But as someone who likes technology businesses and kind of diving into how companies work and and business strategy, like there's not much there on the Bitcoin side. You know, price goes up, store of value, nothing particularly exciting to to kind of break down. When I was kind of introduced to or reintroduced to Ethereum and kind of what was happening there, seeing use cases being built on top, seeing dApps being built on top, seeing NFTs uh, exploding, seeing DeFi exploding, I just realized that there's this whole new kind of ecosystem. This is like a whole different, you know, sort of internet. Uh, and so that was just really exciting to me. I think coming back was that, you know, I, I the, the New York Times just, I think, uh, blamed me a little bit for for you know the Web three uh, moniker in a post that Kevin roosted this weekend, but I do think that there's something to you know it's it being a lot more than cryptocurrency at this point, and that was one of the things that drew me back in. What was that? It wasn't just about the money at this point; it was about so much more and kind of building this thing that uh, the users and the builders get to own. Yeah, it, it does seem from from your journey, Packy, that um, you've been sort of a, a big bull of Web three, and I think we want to get into those themes too. So, you know, for David and I, we're we're also like content producers, and the way we learn about things is like by writing about them or like by hitting the record button on a podcast in order to do it. So, we've always introduced like the stuff that we do on Bankless is it's it's really part of our journey, and like we're inviting uh, a community around us to come you know, um, discover what we're discovering and, and co-discover with us this this strange new world of crypto. And that's very much in, in like reading what you've been writing over the past year or so. That's very much what I've observed um, you doing is you like you do a deep dive, you ask a whole bunch of good questions, uh, and then you 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 kind of um, create a synthesis of the answers to those questions, the best answers you, you can find to those questions in some sort of a post that you publish. So I, I think that like maybe the best way to go through some of this podcast and to, to sort of unpack your brain in what you've discovered since coming back to crypto in, in 2021 is to actually go through some of those posts because they're fantastically written. And uh, we want to get maybe the gist of the, the post. And so th there's like five posts that I think uh, would be really cool for us to go through. But let's start with this first one, which is the post you published, I think, shortly after your Telegram message to me, where you were doing a, a deep dive on this Ethereum thing after a hiatus, after, you know, Bitcoin in 2013 and, you know, the, 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 the sound money meme and all of that maybe didn't resonate with you, but now you've discovered this new thing. And so you wrote this post called Ethereum Own the Internet, a bull case for Ethereum. Um, I, I want to start maybe with this question where we dive into some of the, the sub-themes of this article, but what did you really discover about Ethereum during your, your deep dive at that time? Yeah, so a fun, fun bit of trivia is that the opening quote in that article was a Ryan Sean Adams quote, the most bullish thing for Ether is to be understood. And so uh, you know, I'm going to have to take credit for that one, actually. That one was that one. Was wow. <laughs> so a misattributed Ryan, it Ryan, quote. It was Ryan Sean Adams uh, quoting David quoting. Hoffman. It was, yeah. It's a, Packy McCormick it's, quoting Ryan Sean Adams, <laughs> quoting David Hoffman. The most bullish thing for Ether is to be understood. And, and, it's a Michael so, Scott, Scott style quote. <laughs> exactly. So I, I mean, a year ago, and it seems crazy, but a year ago is kind of when I think Ethereum started breaking into like the very popular uh, consciousness. Like, uh, you know, it was it, getting written up in Bloomberg and Patrick O'Shaughnessy was talking about it on his podcast. So for people who were kind of interested in kind of business and technology more broadly. I think early 2021 is when people really started kind of relearning about Ethereum. Obviously, you know, you guys have been a, a great resource for that. Uh, one of the things that I think, uh, you know, there's a couple of, of things that that I discovered uh, or kind of just different ways of thinking about uh, Ethereum that I thought were useful. 
One was kind of comparing it just to, you know, thinking about it as a company as opposed to just an asset. So there's obviously like the kind of triple point uh, argument that y'all made that, that I quoted in the piece as well. But just the fact that like, as usage goes up, fees go up and, you know, it, it behaves kind of, you can kind of analyze this like you would analyze a business, I think is, is one interesting thing. thing. Uh, a second one is that Ethereum, I realized kind of writing this, I had just written about, uh, about Excel that Ethereum really seems an awful lot like uh, Excel in a lot of different ways. One, it's kind of Lindy. So the longer it's around, I think, you know, the less likely that anybody's going to come around and kill it. Two, that kind of composability is just built into this thing where in Ethereum or in, in Excel, you can build formulas that build off of each other and you get really, really good at it. And so as you build more and more complex formulas and build bigger and bigger models, you're kind of more and more locked into this thing and gets more and more magical. Same thing with, you know, Ethereum and composability and people uh, kind of mixing and matching primitives. Uh, and, and then just the fact that it is this kind of just distributed computer, which now I think uh, obviously anybody listening to this podcast, but really most people in the world kind of uh, understand, but just was kind of radical to me uh, thinking about it at the time when my previous exposure had really just been Bitcoin. So uh, you, you had this quote uh, in your article as well. Owning ETH is like owning shares in the internet. Uh, demand for ETH will go up with increased Web3 adoption while upcoming changes will decrease the supply of ETH and let more value accrue to holders. It's like a tech stock, a bond, a ticket to Web3 and money rolled into one. That's just a fantastic summary of uh, the bull case for ETH. So you're seeing it, ETH the asset, both tied to Web3 adoption, but also it being sort of a, a unique asset that gives you exposure into like a lot of different upside. It's it's like not limited to just a money or a tech stock. It's kind of something new. It's all of these things combined. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, it's it's kind of this index, right, on, on the adoption of, of Web3 almost where one of the most fascinating things about it is that it, it, you know, and this analogy has been, I think, used uh, many times, but is if you had to, say, buy shares in Amazon and use that to pay for AWS, right? Uh, I think that idea of having to use Web3 by kind of starting by purchasing ETH and then going down the, the rabbit hole from there and swapping it for other things and staking it and doing all this other stuff all starts with buying this thing that also, you know, with with uh, the proof of stake switch and we're on the, on the verge of the merge, um, you know, will essentially, <laughs> will essentially, uh, you know, as, as people use it more and more, you have to buy ETH as you use ETH, the value goes goes up. Uh, and and so that, that was one of those really interesting kind of mental shifts for me is that it really is like kind of buying uh, buying equity almost, uh, except for the fact that you then go and use it. We're about to keep on going down your journey into uh, into other layer ones, because again, we're, we're following Packy's journey through the process of understanding uh, Web3. But before we talk about the other layer ones that, that Packy is interested in, what property or, or quality of Ethereum has that really, really excites you that, that no other L1 has? Oh, I mean, I, I think the legitimacy is, is there for sure. And just the fact that that is where so much of the activity lives uh, and so much of the culture lives. Uh, and you know, it just, it has kind of that beautiful blend of security, um, but you know, composability and flexibility and all, all those types of things that it just feels like a chain that is going to be around for a very, very long time and will continue to get more and more used and more and more valuable. And then what about the inverse of that question? What, what about Ethereum do you think, uh, really holds you back? I'm not going to say anything novel here, right? Like, you know, I think the, mm. the the gas and, and, you know, speed, all the gas has been a little bit more palatable recently, but, you know, paying, paying $10 even, uh, limits the, the kind of use cases that, that you can do. Um, uh, but I, I think that'll get fixed. I, I'm, like I said, super bullish. Packy, do you think that, um, like did, did anything about your re-entry into, into crypto in 2021 re-excite you about Bitcoin at all? Or is it possible now to come back into crypto in 2021 and like completely ignore Bitcoin? I've I've probably actually to my detriment, I think ignored Bitcoin maybe even too much. I mean, you know, so much is so much of the, I think the value in the space moves with uh, with Bitcoin still. And I'm, I'm awaiting the flipping, listening, uh, listening to Bankless and and getting updates on how close we are to it. But uh, I think for now, uh, you know, at least from a financial perspective. 
um, so much of the industry moves with Bitcoin that it, it's, I, I probably ignore it at my own peril. I just don't find it particularly interesting. I, I find the idea interesting and I, I own a little bit of it and it will sit there, but there's not like a ton more to explore from that point. And so I just haven't, you know, I, I watched the price and that's about it. Just uh, b before we move on from uh, Ethereum too, I'm wondering if you could kind of paint the the picture of the um, the Web three value proposition for us a little bit more. So, what is it about Web three? What does this term even mean to you, and um, how does that relate to what you first saw in Ethereum? Sure. So, Web three the the definition that I've used is that it's the internet owned by the users and the builders orchestrated with tokens. And I think there's just so much that you can do when you're able to give ownership in the thing that people are using and building. Uh, and when you're able to use tokens as incentives uh, and use you know, whether that's fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, use those things as incentives to guide behaviors and design richer systems than you could otherwise. And you cut out the middleman, not in any kind of zealot uh, or a zealous way, but in a real impactful way where both sides of the equation who are adding value to the system are able to pull more value out of the system. Um, that That's what uh, I think is so powerful about, about Web3 to me. Okay, well, let's uh, let's keep moving. So this is sort of the first milestone that we we picked up in your in your crypto journey, your newfound uh, crypto journey in 2021, which is um, Ethereum, the ability to own the internet, right? And this is where you know the Web three kind of starts at some level. Although some might argue Web Web three is also a Bitcoin thing. I'm not sure Bitcoin maximalists would embrace that, but um, we tend to think Bitcoin is just a, another piece of Web three. Um, but you said this in your uh, Ethereum article as well. You also talked about some of the risks to Ethereum being like kind of um, transaction fees and the cost to actually use uh, the main chain network. And you said the L1 that I'm most excited about besides Ethereum is Solana. Uh, and of course, that was a, actually a good time to be excited about Solana, or at least it was a good time to be buying Solana for sure, the sole token. Uh, at uh, When did you publish the Ethereum article? Was that in like April? It was May. That okay. was May of 21. Okay, so it's May. So it's right before this thing that um, the Solana community calls Solana Summer, where Solana had a fantastic price run. Uh, and uh, also, we're seeing some real traction on Solana. Solana. So let's talk about the, the second article and the genesis for that article, which is Solana Summer. So clearly, before this article, you've, you had been looking at Solana and been bullish about Solana. But can you tell us why you were excited about it? Was it was it really the transaction fees? Were there other elements in play that made you excited about the uh, Solana ecosystem? Sure. So in the the smallest of small worlds, uh, Ben Sparango, who works at, at Solana and introduced us, was my neighbor growing up, and so I, I know that he'd, he he was, and so you know I know that he'd been uh, involved in the space for a little while, and I'd kind of tracked him, but as I was kind of out of the space, wasn't tracking as closely. Then I came back in and and caught up with him, and he told me kind of why he went to Solana and what he was so excited about and what he was working on. Introduced me to Anatoly, uh, and just kind of got more and more bullish. I mean, transaction fees and speed are obviously. Uh, two of the things that that got me excited to start. But I think the thing, you know, the way that I tried to frame the piece and the way that I try to frame a lot of the things that I, I write about crypto is not as this completely other thing, but as a thing that kind of follows, you know, some of the same rules that most businesses have to follow, but just with some, you know, supercharged tokenomics built into the mix. And so for Solana, it's really kind of a platform dynamic where Solana does well if it's able to acquire developers who build products that acquire users. And it's kind of, you know, that that simple. Uh, and so what attracted me was that I started talking to more and more and more people who were building on top of Solana. And it felt like there was a lot of developer interest moving over there. How about the uh, the, the transaction fees in Solana? So in, in your article, um, you, you wrote this, I think at the time, it cost something like $3 to do a transaction on Bitcoin. And at the time, massively high gas fees people probably remember this in may of last year eight to forty dollars on ethereum mainnet uh and at the time it only cost 0 0.001 cents like a fraction of a penny to do a transaction on solana do you think that is the big kind of value proposition that something like solana brings aside from like of course ethereum has a fantastic community um but aside from that is it is it mostly about transaction fees and decreasing the cost of those I think it's transaction fees and speed, right? It just feels performant. There's, uh, I, I'm going to blank on the name. Maybe we can put it in the show notes afterwards. But there's a website that you can go to on Solana 
that actually lets you kind of just execute transactions in real time as fast as you can kind of hit a button. And it shows those those transactions uh, settling like kind of within seconds. And it's just a very different experience than uh, operating on Ethereum where you're used to, you know, signing a transaction with a MetaMask and just kind of waiting for a little while until, uh, you know, something something happens. So I think there's that speed element uh, that that attracts uh, people in, in addition to the, the the low transaction costs, which is which is really nice as well. Do you think that's what a lot of people are looking for? Like when they come, I mean, everyone's used to mainstream, right? It's like mainstream is used to a Web2 experience where just like I click the button and the thing works, right? It's like very easy to use. Uh, in crypto, uh, we're kind of used to like janky, user interfaces and so like i mean people that use the original maker dao interface you know they they see the the abilities that the new generation have today and like the, the like the seamless things you can do in metamask and they think oh man this is fantastic it's so easy to use but if you talk to like you know your mom and get her to do something in DeFi, she's going to be completely flustered like have no idea how things work because it's so clunky and difficult. Do you think that is part of the appeal of something like Solana? Hey, this thing just kind of works the same way the internet does and you click a button and things happen and that's it. A hundred percent. I think, you know, one of my maybe less popular uh, takes is just that, you know, the people who care the the most about decentralization, the people who are most willing to put up janky uh, with janky experiences to interact with crypto are probably the people who are already in the space. And so as you think about onboarding the next billion users, which every product, in, including Solana, uh, claims to want to do, I think making an experience that feels more and more and more like Web 2 uh, from a usability perspective, like kind of the promise of the you know Web 3 is that it combines the open uh, kind of permissionless nature of Web 1 with the usability of, of Web 2. And so I think the, the closer and closer you move to usability experiences that people are used to, the better it will be. So you're almost like a, a UX maximalist then a little bit, like I, not a maximalist, but you know, things like this, anything maybe, but like, as far as you think that you would prioritize user experience is, is one of the most important things about the crypto experience. I think it really depends who you're, who you're building for. Like, so I, I wrote about uh, flow recently as well. And I think kind of similar, similar argument there where there is a portion of people for whom I would much rather they own their NFT and own their digital assets than not. And if that means that, you know, short term, you're not fully decentralized and you're using your credit card and uh, it feels more like a Web2 experience, but you own the thing, that's great. And, and you know, there's a, a large portion of the population for whom that's really valuable. There's a smaller but super valuable and, and passionate portion of the community for whom the Jackie experience is kind of part of the fun and it makes you feel <laughs> like you're a part of something. And it's almost like a video game where, you know, part of the, the beauty of a video game is that you're doing something that's hard but achievable. And there's something about that in, in crypto as well. So I'm not necessarily like a, a clean, smooth, easy on ramp maxi, although I think they're super valuable to get the next billion people into the space. Uh, but I do think that for, uh, you know, for, for certain use cases, speed, low cost and just usability does matter. One of the aspects about Solana that I know has compelled you, Packy, and, and many, many others is uh, the commitment to uh, uh, blockchain-wide composability, right? Like not sharding, uh, not having layer twos so that every single DeFi app is on the same plane as every other DeFi app. And that in combination with like the low transaction fees is, is really compelling to a lot of people. I'm, I'm wondering uh, that that's uh, if uh, I believe that's what caught your attention about Solana in the first place. And, and I'm wondering if you're um, philos philosophically that has turned into a, a debate between people that kind of believe in the modular blockchain thesis versus people that are really committed to not trying to break composability. And I'm, I'm wondering how your thoughts and, and mental models about this has developed over time. I'm probably a bad podcast guest because I, 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 my, my answers are somewhere, you know, in, in the middle on a lot of things. I think for certain use cases, so, you know, certain DeFi use cases on Solana, I think having kind of full composability is valuable. I don't think full composability is valuable for everything. I think when you think about, um, you know, when, you, again, going back to kind of the, the flow piece, like the fact that, uh, you know, NFTs are able to kind of own different things and just kind of compose a little bit more nicely and, and do a lot in one transaction uh, without without sharding uh, on on flow. I think there's value to that for certain use cases. And then there's some use cases for which I don't think it matters at all. But, you know, I think, Ryan, uh, you, when we first messaged, had thoughts on uh, on kind of composability and, and sharding. So I'd love to hear hear your thoughts. Oh, I can't remember what I said, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, 
I, I think probably some of our thoughts right now are, and like, you know, David and I probably skew a bit more uh, decentralization, not not maximalist. I wouldn't call myself a maximalist about anything, but like as close to maybe maximalist as we are about any of the priorities in crypto and that in that we think that like strong property property rights is really the the basis of the system for like the long-term achievement mm -hmm. of of its goals. And so um we've we've done a lot of like work on uh, exploring and, and talking about this this whole design philosophy, the difference between a modular blockchain and a monolithic, or something like uh, Solana is trying is going down the monolithic path, where they're trying to kind of expand their base layer and put consensus and, and data and execution all inside of the same system. And there are some probably user experience, at least in the early phases, um, uh, you know. There's a lot of value produced by that because you preserve composability. And in the earliest phases, of course, you have um, high transaction throughput and gas fees are cheap and all of these great things. And I think some uh, a network like Solana is probably using these things to build this early network effect and create a fantastic ecosystem for itself. And if I was kind of going up against a, a Bitcoin or Ethereum, I was looking at a, a spot in the scalability trilemma to go like park my niche. That would probably be a a reasonable place to go try try to try to attack and and carve out my space. Um, I think for for David and I, we probably don't think it's as uh, a durable competitive advantage over time. Um, we think that ecosystems that are like it, it's basically like. The question of is UX more important or is decentralization more important? It's like, why can't we have both? And we think that um, the modular blockchain like design gets you both over time, where you're kind of separating consensus and data availability and execution, and you're doing more on these rollups. But it's going to take more time to kind of get there and to mm -hmm. smooth out the user experience because you have many various rollups you have like you know bridging where you have to bridge your assets in between and so it's going to be a longer term journey but we also think it's going to be the one that um is the most effective at preserving decentralization and also at sustaining a competitive moat in the future but it's also like who knows how this will shape up right so who knows what Solana will do in the future? Ethereum has certainly taken many zigs and zags in its roadmap, um, as has Bitcoin as well. So um, at some level, like the competition is fantastic as well. Uh, but um, it's, it's also important that we as a crypto space preserve that decentralization, at least, you know, that, that's kind of our take. I think David wants to chime in too. Yeah. In, in addition to that, like there is always a concern of just like, uh, do we really want, uh, do people want to be bridging all the time? Like, are we asking every single user to be bridge ors? And at least th there is like research out there uh, with on the ZK uh, rollup side of things The when you have ZK rollups, uh, especially liquidity across ZK rollups, like one Uniswap style AMM on one ZK rollup with a uh, liquidity on a different, different rollup. There actually is uh, technology out there, research out there that, that, uh, allows synchronous uh, syncing of liquidity across ZK rollups. And so while you're on different rollups, the liquidity is shared. And so there's like little tricks and tools like this that allows for composability across rollups that we know exist, we just have not yet applied. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of these like UX problems that do have solutions and they're solved through cryptography, which is like hard mode, right? Cryptography is always hard mode, but it's also the way that you preserve decentralization while also solving some of these UX issues. And so the what I think Ryan would agree is like the, the I think we we both think the hardest problem in crypto is getting your monetary policy fixed, uh, and that is the thing that we have not seen any uh, any alternative layer ones be able to be able to do. And so you know what Solana offers in uh, like cheap transaction transaction fees and universal composability, it loses in an insane amount of issuance of the Sol token to provide that service. Uh, and so we kind of think that if you're not playing to be money, you're playing to be uh, sub like uh, you're not playing to win, right? Like the, the game is to be an empire and an empire kind of needs to have its own native currency. And if your currency has a hole in the ship because it has to issue a ton in order to provide the services that it's providing, 
then then you're you're playing to lose uh and and not to say that this is the end all be all state for solana like through like like ethereum had issuance very very high issuance at, at the beginning of of its um of, of, of its trajectory but also the difference was that uh ethereum also was focused on that as a culture and as a community from very 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 early on yeah i mean i i'm incredibly excited for the the zero knowledge future um mm -hmm. and, and i think there's you know there's just so many so many benefits there uh that that I, you know I, i'm again super 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 bullish on ethereum and that's that's one of the reasons that that's the case i also think that you know the current kind of bridging and l2 experience is harrowing for me let alone you know <laughs> we're talking about my mom trading DeFi like there is no way that she is sending money over a bridge, even to Polygon, uh, and waiting and wondering where that money went and right. if it will ever hit the other side and all of those types of things. And so I think to kind of keep that like beautiful internet tracking curve of crypto adoption that that we've seen, having other L1s that that take different approaches now, and to your point, may change over time, but that take different approaches uh, now, I think is a really, really valuable thing for for the space generally. Uh, can we talk? I'm curious, Pac, you, you, you have this great section in your uh, Solana article about how value accrues to Solana, where uh, you also summarize how it accrues to Bitcoin and ETH. And I think you do a really good job of that. And then you try to put into words how value might accrue to the soul token. And I'm curious to dig into that. But I, I guess, you know, the, the summary here is, um, you know, you're, you're saying Bitcoin acts as a store of value which is a mix of intersubjective belief, just like the meme value, let's call it. Uh, also supply and demand, the fact that there will only be 21 million Bitcoin. There's also these other things like a, the, the mining cost floor. And then maybe there's this, um, this market cap based on gold price could be one of the intersubjective beliefs that we're measuring uh, it against. So it's basically a store of value. Um, and then you also see ETH as a triple point money in that uh, a triple point asset in that it is a store of value it is also a consumable. So it's every time, you, you know, you spend ETH on on uh, block space and there's block space demand. Some of that ETH is burnt. Right. And that goes back to, to holders in the form of negative issuance. And it's also a capital asset when you stake. We've certainly talked a lot about that on Bankless. Um, and then you said this, Soul uh, behaves similarly to ETH with a, a few key differences. It's also a triple point money. Uh, and so you also compared it to, to ETH in this way. You said it's also kind of a store of value because within the Soul native economy, mm -hmm. you can use it as collateral for DeFi in the, in the same way you can use ETH in the Ethereum economy. It's also a consumable asset. Um, they uh, a little bit of soul is burnt every time, so they have a mechanism similar to EIP fifteen five nine, and there's a staking mechanism as well. So triple point and all of those things, except you said one thing that's different. I really want to get into this uh, is how soul accrues value is a bit more complicated because the the two main ways soul accrues value right now, in your opinion, is staking and. Uh, MEV, which stands for minimum extractable value or maximum. minor extractable, maximum, excuse me, or minor extractable value in a proof of work uh, mode. I wonder if you could dig into that, specifically the, the, the sole value proposition, because this is where I think um, some people have trouble like figuring out what the value of soul is. We had uh, Anatoly on a couple months ago on, on a podcast and we were like, hey, Anatoly, is soul money? He's like, no, we're not trying to be, not trying to be money. I don't think soul is going for the, the monetary premium aspect of it, but maybe maybe it becomes a money as a result of its economy. How do you think about Sol the asset and its value? Yeah, so the the interesting one here, and the reason that uh, that I said it gets a little more complicated, and I'll try to try to explain it is the way that I think Ben described it to me, and and as I dug in, I, I think I kind of came to believe is that um, you know essentially the projects that are building on top of Solana. Are incentivized to have the value of Sol high enough such that the value of the chain or the market cap of the chain, the mar market cap of, of Sol staked uh, to to kind of secure the chain, is higher than all of the the, the value uh, of all of the things being built on top of Solana, uh, or else there's incentive to go out and and attack the network and and drain everything on top. And so it's almost like the projects building on Solana. As they get more and more successful, or more and more incentivized to to buy and stake Solana, make the price go up, make it more secure, almost like they're paying security. You know, like like they'd be paying 
for security software, except buying and staking the sole token, which is, uh, you know, creates creates more demand and, and locks it up. Uh, on the MEV side, I think this is a little more future state, but this is uh, this is one of the things that that Anatoly has pointed to, uh, and I'll just quote him on it. He said that. MEV means that validators have some information that they've computed that if they take your order, they can make a profit. If the info you're submitting is useful enough to someone, they'll actually pay you to take your order. It's payment for order flow at a micro level, but in a fair and open market. It makes the high frequency trading spread a commodity. So I think that's a really interesting idea. And, and back to kind of this idea of owning the internet and cutting out the middleman and value accruing to both sides is that there's this concept that particularly at the time when the Robin Hood scandal was happening, Payment for order flow is viewed as this really bad thing, like one, you know, a, a one party paying to get information to give them an advantage in the market. Here, the really interesting thing about it is that the people who own and are staking soul accrue the value from M uh, from MEV in this case. And so, uh, you know, if there's if somebody has information they can make money off of, uh, people who who own soul as opposed to Citadel are the ones kind of capturing that that value. So that I guess the the MEV portion of things, where uh, stakers are receiving a portion of transaction fees, basically getting getting paid by users who want their block their block to come in first, right, or or be ordered in a certain way. That's where it transforms Soul into a cash flowing capital asset. In your opinion, is from the primarily from the MEV. Correct. It's always it's always uh, tricky, you know, in terms of like valuing the, these crypto networks as well. Do you think this is more like like art than science, or do you think this is more narrative than actual concrete, you know, valuation? Um, you, you know, I guess discounted cash flow models that we can plug in a spreadsheet. I think ETH is certainly easier, and will you know kind of continue to get uh, to get easier with with the merge. Um, I think in Soul's case, certainly, you know, the maybe I'm just not a good enough scientist, and I'm I'm more of an artist, so I'm going to lean towards the artist side. But just you know, kind of the rough rule of thumb for me is, if activity and value on top of Solana goes up, price of Solana should go up. Now, could I build you a model that tells you what that price should go up to? Absolutely not. And I think that's kind of you know a mix of my shortcoming on the modeling side, and my rustiness there, uh, mixed with the fact that it's a difficult thing to to value and. You know, in all of my time talking to the team, I don't think anybody have ever brought up price once. It, you know, it's just not as you know important an aspect in the community uh, as as it is for other other tokens. I want to get your opinion on how do you think this plays out over the very long time frames, not just five, ten years, but something like you know twenty five plus years. Uh, basically, it's the question of like distribution of of market cap. Do you think that this is a winner take all environment, um, or do you think this is a, a pretty uh, wide distribution of many many layer ones with many many valuable layer one assets? Gosh, I, I think this is a my crystal ball is broken on this one for sure. I think that one of the interesting things to see happening will be to see, you know, as wormhole and layer zero and some of these uh, other kind of, you know, cross chain uh, bridging platforms emerge. I think it'll be really interesting to see if, if uh, they all kind of behave as almost one big blockchain uh, with everything kind of coming back and settling on Ethereum, including Ethereum's own L2s, but even non EVM compatible chains like, uh, like Solana. I think that's one way that it plays out. I think probably there, there's certainly, you know, as there are with most things, power laws, and I think a lot of value accrues to to Ethereum over time. Um, but I do think that we're, we'll have a multi-chain, probably not super wide distribution, probably like a, you know a few chains that do particular things very well, uh, and then maybe all kind of settle back on on Ethereum. I, something that you said there, I think, is is worth uh, pulling apart, uh, where you kind of alluded to like these coming the coming together of all these different chains, including L ones and, and layer twos, and the, the I think the image to present to users is something like a superstructure where we have all these. We can use the model of DeFi growth on Ethereum to start with, where first we had MakerDAO and it produced Dai, and then later we had Compound and it was a money market, but they were all very separate and over time all these things started to really come together. And DeFi on Ethereum is really starting to not just be individual applications, but one significant structure of all these interoperable composed applications. Uh, but the, what you just said was actually the first time I've heard that articulated uh, across layer ones, 
where not only can the DeFi ecosystem of one single chain be start to coalesce into one single superstructure, but you think the entire crypto universe can become one single like composable financial superstructure. Is that is that is that a fair articulation? I think it's a fair articulation. I, I don't see how that doesn't happen over time, right? Like that, you know, if, if you had to use a different credit card on a bunch of different websites, uh, you know, that would be a real pain. I do mm -hmm. think that there are network effects to, uh, you know, kind of building developer and user ecosystems on top of these chains. And that I don't know if everybody moves all use case over to one chain or to one L2 or to multiple L2s on top of, on top of Ethereum. I would imagine that, that ultimately you kind of create the, the L1 superstructure. Um, but you know, obviously very TBD and there are people a lot smarter than, than me on this. That would be just my kind of best, best guess here. I mean, like you even look at something like, you know, Cello, where they're starting to build a, a network of all the kind of regenerative finance and climate-based projects. And so, you know, part of that might be the technical capabilities of the chain, but part of it is you just build kind of differentiation and an identity into the platform and you start attracting a certain type of project. So do those all move off at some point and go to Ethereum or does Cello kind of bridge into Ethereum? I think, you know, it, open question, but uh, it'd be hard to see kind of just everything deciding to, to shift off. I um I kind of you know what helps me in in sort of the superstructure lens is actually thinking of everything as a chain. Just think of every everything's a chain. Do you know what I mean? Like your Wells Fargo account is a chain. It's just a it's just a side chain. Okay, yeah. like Coinbase, it's a chain. It's a chain of blocks in a way. It's just a like centralized chain. Binance, that is also a chain. These are all chains. Google right? Excel, so, Excel sheets. Yeah, chain. I mean it's everything's a ledger, right? Everything's a chain. And, um, and like what some of these more open, more permissionless, more decentralized chains are doing is kind of like uniting the chains, like bringing them together, being sort yeah. of the, like the, uh, the base settlement infrastructure to kind of draw them all in, uh, to, to themselves. And so I think we're already living in a world of chains. It's just like this whole multi-chain narrative has been recently because there's like, you know, conflict between alternative layer ones and there's conflict between like Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's like a lot of tribalism in the space. But if you zoom all the way out, you already see a world full of chains on some spectrum of centralization or de decentralization. We're just doing more of this moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I, ultimately, I think probably if you zoom out 50 years, Cardano wins. But in the in the interim, <laughs> uh, I can be I'm partial kidding. to many, many arguments, but not that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing you know, I've, I've written before that I'm a, a you know maximalist minimalist, which essentially kind of means like I, I'm not you know maxi on any chain or even on any aspect. I think there's different use cases uh, that that need different things at different times, and even different people need different things at at different times. Times. But I think that we can all agree that uh, you know th that being bearish on Cardano is, is what unites well, a lot of us. Can, can I ask you because it does unite a lot of us, but not everyone. Okay, not everyone. Can I ask you? Say, let me ask you a question. As somebody who's you know uh, came into the space, and I think there's some advantage to like looking at the space from fresh eyes and like anew, because um, you're kind of like the kid walking in the cafeteria, right? And there's all of these little like you know, uh, clicks, like different groups, you get the jocks and you got the, you know, the skaters or whatever else. Right. And, and everyone's like, Hey, you know, Packy come to our tribe, like join us. Like we're, we're the, you know, the real deal. And you get to sort of just choose, you get to kind of look and maybe not pick any one tribe. But I guess my point is crypto has been so tribal and you've been able to look at it with fresh eyes, but you've also been able to like, see what the obvious, non-starter chains are like the obvious communities and ecosystems that aren't going anywhere can you tell us about that like what were some of the ecosystem like how did you figure out what was clearly like not going to work when you did this uh deep dive analysis as you walked into the school cafeteria sure so I, i'm i know that i'm gonna get dunked on by the the cardano community i did for it's writing okay. the, yeah it's, i don't know if they it's listen a, it's to a norm <laughs> on the podcast <laughs> here yeah I, I don't think there's many in our audience okay, good if so <laughs> they're good. used to the abuse <laughs> um so the the way that i looked at it when i was writing about ethereum was kind of thinking about trains that felt like they were directly trying to compete with ethereum uh 
which you know, I kind of I think I put Cardano in the camp at the time, and then chains that were trying to do something else, which is why I wrote that I was bullish on you know Solana and and Flow because they were very clearly building for a particular use case and building in a way that was very different from uh, how Ethereum had. And then as I dug in, like you, I, I haven't been at the Cardano website for a, a little while, but just like the the language that they use on the web, like it just feels like a scam project and you know like the kind of language that you'd use if you're trying to trick a bunch of people um they've done a, i mean obviously like a, a very good job i think of making it like an us versus them mentality i asked i made the mistake of asking on twitter you know what l1 people were most bearish on and i said don't say cardano because we're all bearish on cardano or something like that and a lot of people kind of came back and were like yeah of course you're a vc there's no way for a vc to make money on cardano ignoring the fact that you know one of the reasons charles is no longer at ethereum is because he you know, was greedy, you know, short term kind of greedy there, all of that. It's just a very weird, like, you know, using tribalism as like the only thing, uh, as opposed to kind of any real activity on top of the blockchain. If you use the same heuristic that I use for Solana, where there's a bunch of developer activity happening on Solana, that's not there on, on Cardano. I've not used a project ever uh, that's been built uh, on, on Cardano. Uh, and so those are some of the kind of things that I yeah, look at. I, one thing we've said for a while, and I'm wondering if you, you think this experience is true too, is like it, the way to like cut through all of the BS is like, go start using some apps. Mm -hmm. like, stop looking at, like listening to what YouTubers say and people on Twitter and like go actually use the stuff. Go check there was out one time wallet, I asked, go check out an app. There was one time I asked on Twitter, hey, can somebody point me to like where I can swap tokens on Cardano? Like where's the Uniswap of Cardano? And somebody, some Cardano shill in my, in my replies sent me to a link that was a website that advertised being the Uniswap on Cardano. Wasn't live yet, but the link took me to go, to, when I wanted to hit the enter app button, the link took me to go buy a token on Ethereum's Uniswap. And so I'm like, <laughs> ooh. And so, like, which, which leads to a question. You, you talked about how like, um, you, you got your the Cardano Bros re replies in your in your your on your Twitter feed about like, oh, like, you know, anti-VC narrative, like VCs don't invest in Cardano. And we've seen this narrative weaponized many, many times before. This was definitely a very significant part of the culture of the Wonderland project from the, the following of Danny, Danny Sesta. Uh, and Ryan and I were the brunt of, of that uh, when uh, I didn't know who Danny Sesta was. And then we all of a sudden were like VC bros or something like that. It was crazy. And so, and so again, going to what Ryan was saying about coming into this industry with fresh eyes, uh, t talking about with some of the more legitimate chains, when you see, when you come into the lunchroom and you see like the Solana click and you see the Avalanche click and you see the Ethereum click, how would you describe the differences in those cultures? If Are there any differences that stand out, stand out to you? There's no huge differences that really stand out among the legitimate chains. I mean, I think that, you know, maybe Solana feels like a little bit like like the blockchain behaves like it feels a little bit kind of faster paced and maybe a little bit more degen although there's obviously plenty and plenty plenty of degen on both uh avalanche and ethereum um but i think that they all have or you know i've spent a lot more time in the solana and ethereum ecosystems the two of them i think have you know very kind of like positive uh kind of internal community um and and i think there's a, a big emphasis on actually using the products i mean like to, for me when i came in and started playing around in the space one of the first big aha moments for me was when i was working with the team at mirror to make one of the pieces that i wrote both uh, uh you know ownable as an nft but then kind of automatically also distribute the proceeds to all the people that i uh that i cited in the piece and like doing that i was just like this is really magical and that was because, you know, people in the space, when I had said that I was kind of getting interested, were like, oh, you should try to do this, you should try to do this, you should try to do this, as opposed to buy our token, buy our token, buy our token. Uh, and so I think getting that first kind of real hands-on experience, playing with something and having it do something that I couldn't have done otherwise, uh, I think is, you know, the, the kind of value of both those ecosystems is pointing people that way. Aave is the leading decentralized liquidity protocol, and now Aave V3 is here. Aave V3 has powerful new features to enable you to get the most out of DeFi, including isolation mode, which allows for many more markets to be launched with more exotic collateral types, and also efficiency mode, which allows for higher loan to value ratios, and of course, portals, allowing users to port their Aave position across all of the networks that Aave operates on, like Polygon, Phantom, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Optimism, and Harmony. The beautiful thing about Aave is that it's completely 
completely open source, decentralized, and governed by its community, enabling a truly bankless future for us all. To get your first crypto collateralized loan, get started at Aave.com. That's A-A-B-E.com. And also check out the Aave Protocol Governance Forums to see what more than 100,000 DAO members are all robbing about at governance.ave.com. MakerDAO is the OG DeFi protocol. The MakerDAO produces DAI, the industry's most battle-tested and resilient stablecoin. Using Maker, you don't need to sell your collateral if you need liquidity. Instead, you can spin up a Maker Vault and use your collateral to mint DAI directly. With Maker, the power to mint new money is in your hands. The Maker protocol is extremely hardened and operated by one of the most experienced DAOs in existence. They've been here since the beginning, they've seen it all, and so you can mint DAI with the assurance that your collateral is safe. Soon, Maker will be present on all chains and L2s, so minting DAI can take place on Oasis.app, Zerion, Zapper, or any other DeFi protocol that you use. Follow Maker on Twitter, at MakerDAO, and learn from the oldest and most resilient DAO in existence. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 50 million monthly active users. Control your digital footprint with built-in privacy and ad blocking. Inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the first secure crypto wallet built natively inside of a Web3 crypto browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy. But there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. The Brave wallet is different. Brave wallet is built natively inside the Brave browser, no extension required, which gives the Brave wallet an extra level of security versus other wallets. With the Brave wallet, you can buy, store, send, and swap your crypto assets, and you can even manage your NFTs and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps, all from the security of the best privacy browser on the market. Whether you're new to crypto or a seasoned pro, it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. Okay, so we're uh, we're, we're checking the box on Packy's you know, travel. So we started with Ethereum and like looking at this whole Web3 thing and exploring that. Now we looked at some alternative layer ones, uh, in particular Solana. Now let's talk about this uh, this other article that you wrote, which is like a big theme of 2021 that I think you you dove into headfirst, and indeed all of us dove into headfirst, which is NFTs. And you wrote this fantastic article called uh, "Status Monkeys," and there's a little bit of theory in this article at first that maybe we want to start with uh, about the status monkeys, because who are the status monkeys? All of us, <laughs> human <laughs> beings, are status monkeys, right? And I think you you cited a, a status as a service article um, from e Eugene Way. And uh, I wasn't actually familiar with who he was. Maybe you could describe what that is. But I just want to read out the uh, the two bullet points for Eugene, Eugene Way's thesis that, that you articulated, uh, which is, number one, people, all of us, are status-seeking monkeys. And number two, people seek out the most efficient path to maximizing social capital. And I think Eugene wrote this in 2019 before NFTs were like, quote unquote, a thing, like a cultural thing. But you say he sort of laid the foundation and kind of almost like in this article predicted the rise of NFTs. Can you tell us about this? What's this idea behind status as a service? Yeah, so this quote that we have up on screen, I'm, I'm going to read uh, from Eugene Way from the article, which said, social capital is in many ways a leading indicator of financial capital. And so its nature bears greater scrutiny. Not only is it good investment or business practice, but analyzing social capital dynamics can help to explain all sorts of online behavior that would otherwise seem irrational. And like, you know, I, I have been a Eugene Way fan for a while. He's written a bunch of, you know, really great essays, particularly on kind of social media platforms. He's done some great work on TikTok. He has this essay, uh, Status as a Service, which might be his most popular ever, which essentially describes how new platforms, uh, new social platforms are able to kind of take off. And it really is like kind of by creating a new proof of work that uh, is a, a kind of appeals and is doable by a younger generation of people. So if you missed out building a huge Twitter following or, you know, people who are older and have been on the platform a while have big Twitter followings because they were funny and they were good at writing 140 characters and like they got really good at that proof of work, the next generation comes in and they lip sync and make videos and do all the things that they did on Musical.ly, which became TikTok, because like that's kind of the new proof of work that can help you gain status. And that for any platform that comes out to, to take off and to kind of reach the kind of scale that a Twitter or a TikTok or a Facebook has, you need kind of a new proof of work that's not the same as other when you say platforms. proof of work, do you mean like, like, is it proof of status? Is that really what you're talking about? It's, I guess, proof of status, but it, it really is like this idea that, you know, you're good at this thing that the platform values. Ah. Uh, and so you're like, 
you know, on and Twitter, that gives you, can you be, status. That bestows you status. That 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 then bestows you status. Proof of performance. And then proof of performance or proof of like yeah, yeah proof of uh, appealing to the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. whatever mm -hmm. whatever it may it may be. Um, but that any any platform that comes in and tries to kind of steal that same mechanism from an existing platform is going to fail. And so I think one of the really uh, interesting things to me in, in rereading that article was that, you know, there's a lot of attempts and will continue to be a lot of attempts, and I hope some of them work, of building kind of decentralized versions of the existing kind of social media platforms by using almost the same product and almost kind of the same proof of algorithm or proof of performance or whatever we want to call it. And I think that actually might be trickier than people think. And that something new like NFTs actually behaves maybe more like a Web3 social network that's native to this new thing that, you know, either says I have money. And so that's one way of status in, in Web2. You can still bring in exogenous capital if, you know, when Obama signed up for Twitter, if he hadn't been on there first, he would get a million followers instantly. But any random person like us would sign up. It would take a while. I think it's very, very similar to NFTs where you can either buy your way in because you have exogenous capital or you can be early to projects. You can be deeply involved in the space. You can participate in communities. You can turn your board ape into a mutant ape. You can do all the things that you need to do to prove that you're a part of this community. And so it almost feels like kind of the first social network on top of all the other social networks is this NFT layer. That's fascinating. And the ability to like, um, I guess, convert some of your social capital right into like actual monetary capital liquidity is kind of is kind of new and that's kind of interesting there's also pack this this um this graph that you put in where i think um way uh talks about uh like th three elements three important elements here ingredients um to all of this which is like social capital is one kind of dimension also utility but also this third thing which is entertainment uh can you describe what is this graph showing us here the graph is showing the types of things. So it, you're essentially looking at a quadrant with another axis, uh, or another line kind of uh, through through the middle, social capital, entertainment, utility from low to high, and that any new social network that uh, is going to emerge and, and kind of reach scale needs to be high on social capital, uh, which you know g gives people the opportunity to build up their social capital. It needs to have utility. So you know, rem remember Facebook, like Facebook was valuable in the beginning because it let you connect with people that you went to high school with, or, uh, you know, it let you find that person that you met at the party the night before. So there's some utility that kind of kicks everything uh, off, come for the utility, stay for the network. And then there's this entertainment value of, oh, this is really fun. So going back to the Facebook example again, there has to be something like scrolling through the news feed, seeing what your friends did last night that is actually really fun or scrolling through, you know, TikTok is really, really fun. Uh, so it has to have kind of at different stages in its life, uh, a mix of high social capital uh, gaining ability, high entertainment, and high utility. And then you could put like NFTs on the same graph, on the same axis as uh, axis as well. I think that you know. So what what it shows is that right now NFTs already kind of high social capital within the space. I have high utility that is debatable, and every project has utility somewhere on its roadmap. Uh, and then entertainment is kind of becoming. Uh, you know, is is going up. I know you guys talked about uh, the the board ape yacht club round and trying to build the metaverse. So, for example, if your board ape actually gets you into a game world uh, and you can play around and it's fun, uh, just even being part of the community is fun. Like, it, there's all these entertaining pieces to it. Um, but you know, being able to show a board ape on your profile picture, there's a reason people do it. It's to show that they have status. It's to show their social capital uh, and then utility. Again, debatable, but. Uh, at least will give you access to a community, might give you access to future drops, you know, and then hopefully over time, more utility will be built in into things. And so NFTs kind of fit perfectly into the Eugene way definition of, of status as a service. Yeah, that's really one cool. Of, one of the aspects it, about NFTs that uh, I think a lot of people, when they get confused about why are we spending like millions of dollars on board apes or why are we spending so much money money on NFTs? It's it's a lot of what you were just talking about, uh, like, you know, access, uh, entertainment, vibes, but also it's the resaleability, which is also the utility. And that is the novel thing about NFTs. It's like, no, you're not purchasing uh, a $5,000 like monkey figurine that's gonna sit in your, in your house, right? You are it's buying- It's an investment. A, it's an asset that you are purchasing. <laughs> 
and you That's are just I kind of like my wife, <laughs> right? Like you have, and, and I mean, when you get this wrong, you like, this is where you get wrecked, right? You buy the NFT that goes down to zero just because no one, everyone else forgot to buy it. But like the thesis of NFTs is that you can buy this as an investment and then it gets you one, it gets you an infinite access to the, the social capital and that is utility in of itself. But you also, if it's a good NFT, you have the ins- assurances that your capital is also preserved. Uh, and so like a, a lot of like NFT naysayers are like, why are people wasting so much money? It, you're not wasting it. You're just transforming it into something that has social capital and utility and entertainment. A hundred percent. And I, I mean, I think one of the starkest ways to look at that is the the Visa buying a CryptoPunk example, mm-hmm. yeah. where they paid, what was it, $150,000, which is cheaper than they would have paid for any marketing campaign, mm-hmm. you know, regardless. And they have an asset that is now worth more. So they, they essentially got paid to get all of that marketing exposure by buying uh, by buying a CryptoPunk. And I think that's a, a stark way of, of kind of putting that that value that you get all this stuff for free or even, you know, that will pay you over time. You use this uh, term investment uh, as status. So is is that just the idea that like you're also in a lot of the the social networks in Web two, we are kind of um, I guess active contributors, but but passive investors, right? So I build up my Twitter profile, but I can't take it with me. I can't take my follower list uh, with me outside of that network. Um, but with with NFTs and with Web threes. It's really you are an investor in the status in status networks that you're creating as well. Is that the idea be, behind investment as status? That it is just all of this is much more portable. I think that's that's part of it. Um, it's also I think even beyond Web three, one of the things that I think we kind of all noticed over 2020 and 2021 is that investing became you know particularly for retail more than just you know like the 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 discounted value of future cash flows, it became about, you know, if you're a Tesla shareholder, became about being somebody who cares about the environment, who likes memes, who supports Elon, and also the fact that maybe Tesla will produce a ton of cars over time and make a lot of money. Or, you know, GameStop and AMC are obviously the canonical examples of this, where, you know, there there's uh, part of an investment that is a financial thing, and there's part of an investment which is a status thing, saying, like, I believe in this thing, and I'm putting my money where my mouth is on that. There's another article that you wrote, Packy, that you uh, labeled the Pareto frontier, and I think that's where we want to go to next. Uh, and I think the quote that I think uh, from a, from a different Bankless podcast that I want to bring up is uh, from Chris Dixon when we did our mental models for Web three. Something that stuck with me is he he said that NFTs has made the internet weird again. And that's kind of what, that was the signal for him that like, oh, we're on to something now. Like the internet's w- weird once again. Like people are buying monkeys for millions of dollars. And 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 so we're, I think we want to dive into the Pareto uh, frontier thinking about that as context. Uh, and you, you, this is another graph to, to explain to the listeners where we have money on the vertical axis and then fun on the the horizontal axis and i think that the gist here is you want to maximize both right and there's another quote that comes to mind is the future of the internet is making money online with your friends uh can you kind of just uh, explain the the pareto frontier model for us for for us and the listeners yeah so this is a terrible pun on the pareto frontier which is (laughs) you know with a certain set of resources you can uh if you if you have two axes in this case money on one and fun on the other uh, you can't just push all the way out and have like the maximum amount of fun and the maximum amount of money. There's some frontier where you have to make trade-offs. This will be familiar to anybody who's spent time looking at layer one blockchains, for example. But there's a, a trade-off set that you have to make where either you can have kind of more money and less fun, like you know, an investment banking job, for example, would fit into that category, or you can have more fun but less money. So you know, negative money maybe even by like paying money to go to a concert, for example. The interesting thing about crypto in this context to me is that by baking money into a lot of different things and by baking fun into financial things like you know NFTs or a super fun investment relative to a bond, you can push out the Pareto fund tier. And so you have this set of opportunities that is more kind of money or more you know financially good, uh, potentially if prices are going up, more financially good than any other thing that is that much fun. And you have things that are more fun than any other thing that can make you that much money. And it's a really powerful thing to be able to kind of push that whole thing out for people. I want to put this under the context of DAOs because they're, they're, a line that I've given out a lot is uh, all DAOs are, are really a vibe. 
And if your DAO doesn't have a vibe in it, you're not going to incentivize people to come into the DAO to, to work for the DAO. So your DAO has to have a vibe. If it doesn't have, the vibe is the campfire, right? The, the stronger the vibe, the, the warmer the campfire, the more people you can support around, around, uh, around the vibe. So, so can you put this into the context of DAOs for us? Like how, how do DAOs kind of illustrate this, this uh, fun tier, if you will? Right, so assume that there is you know, a DAO for almost anything that you'd want to do, right? You could go work for a DAO to buy an NBA team, right? So this is something that probably you'd want to do anyway, if given the opportunity, if you're a basketball fan to like work on a group of friends who can buy an NBA franchise. When you put it in the context of a DAO, you can join this thing, you can get the tokens. And as you succeed by doing this fun thing, which is buying an NBA franchise with Grouse House, you also have the potential to make money for your work and you also have the potential to make money as the token appreciates and so you know cross house is maybe a, a, a extreme example because it is financial um but there's all sorts of DAOs where you'd come in and it's probably something that you do anyway people are in group chats with their friends all of the time but by having fun and by participating and by doing something as a group you also have the potential to to make money from that which is not what you normally have when you are just sticking around with your friends in a group chat yeah, this is so cool. It, this is such a this is one of my favorite models that um yeah uh, th that that I've seen on not boring actually packy. Like I just love this cuz it it describes my experience in crypto like perfectly and I think a lot of people's experience just to just to make the the Pareto frontier even more concrete, right? So you're saying you just optimize for 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 two things in a simple model. The things that you do in life are like either money or fun, right? And then you give an example of, let's say you're using a one to 10 scale for, for money and fun. Okay, so let's say I wanted to read a uh, sci-fi book and I do a lot of that. So that might be a, a seven on fun, but it might be like a two on money. I'm not really making money doing that. So it's very low on the money scale, but it's very high in the, on the fun scale, right? It's something I do as a hobby, let's say. Whereas if you talk about reading a finance textbook, okay, well, I need to understand how uh, income statements work. Let's say like I, I need to brush up on my you know financial statement skills. Well, that's probably a six on money. You know, it's probably a pretty useful tool to have in your like business mental model tool set, but man, that's dry. Okay, that's gonna be like a two <laughs> on fun. Um, and we, when we get into talking about like DAOs versus corporations, right? People working at soulless corporations, spending all their time in a cubicle, going into an office every day, doing work they don't love for a mission they don't really care about, um, an investment banker type role where people, you know, spend their their lives competing against other Ivy Leaguers to, to like get the the small set of jobs. That's going to be a nine on money. Okay, you're going to do okay on the money scale as an investment banker, but how fun is that? That may be a one or a two. And this is the beautiful thing about crypto. The beautiful thing about crypto, and I think why all of us are here on this podcast, probably why people are listening, is it like moves the numbers up completely. So like where my old stuff was maybe like my old corporate job was like a three on the fun, but like a, a seven on the money. I work in crypto because it's a nine on the fun scale and a nine on the money. Right. Like, mm -hmm. and that's what you can do as part of a DAO. And it kind of makes you ask the question of like, wow, if, if, if crypto can move up the Pareto frontier for everyone, more fun, more money, making money online with your friends, as David said earlier, how are these traditional institutions going to compete? <laughs> I will never work for a company again. Mm -hmm. I will never go into an office I don't want to go into again, like never again. Why? because it doesn't maximize my Pareto frontier. That's the model. Right, the the frontier has, I think, permanently shifted. And so anything that people are going to do in the future has to at least compete with that. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to do Web3 things always and that every, all the jobs are gonna be crypto jobs, but it does mean that you know maybe you wanna go work in deep tech or you wanna go cure cancer because like that is a 10 on, you, know, you can substitute kind of fun and fulfillment Purpose. for the same thing and, yeah. so, and so like that that like really you know awesome like and if you don't make any money that's also totally fine because like it is so meaningful on one of those scales but are you gonna go build a product that is like a me too version of something that already exists that maybe has a slightly different pricing like probably not gonna do that one anymore uh, and so hopefully what it does is that uh, it pushes out you know just that opportunity set for everybody when this is something that's that's on the table now I, I think it also speaks to the fact that 
you know, one of the critiques of crypto is that like, you know, money's baked in and there's speculation. And it's one of the beautiful things about this is that the things that you would normally want to do and have fun doing, whether that's playing a game or joining a DAO with your friends or all that can actually be your living and make you money. Yeah, like, that is great. really cool. And so yeah. I think speculation and, and money being part of this is like a really great thing. One of the uh, things I wrote in an article a while ago, and uh, actually before I get to that part, there was a, a Friday open thread that we did forever ago. And the question was, how much of a pay cut would you take to get into crypto? And so many people would answer like significant percentages of pay cuts, like somewhere between like 10 and 30%. Like uh, they are just dying to get into crypto. And probably a lot of those properties are probably because the fun meter goes off the charts. Uh, and so people are just dying to get into Web3. The thing is, when you actually end up getting a job in Web3, people end up tending to make more money <laughs> because Web3 can pay for it more because it's an industry about wealth and money. And so while people are saying like, I'm willing to get like a 30% pay cut so I can have more fun in my job, but they are simultaneously also getting a pay raise by coming into this industry. And so something I wrote in an article titled The Future of Work is not only do the legacy institutions of the world have to compete with the permissionless labor monetization tools offered by Ethereum, but they also have to compete with the lifestyle that these tools offer, the freedom to work for oneself. And so th this is why Ryan and, are always, uh, Ryan and I are always saying like, go work for a DAO, go become bankless, join, get on the frontier because the, the freedom that is on the frontier is, is almost infinite. Could not agree, agree more. What are some uh, other examples of this uh, Packy? So like um, we talked about DAOs a little bit, but like tokens in and of themselves are examples. Like, so DAOs are way more fun and potentially more money-making, higher in the Pareto frontier than, than corporations. But I also feel the same about stock, like uh, tokens versus stocks. Like I kind of like, why buy stocks when we have tokens? I mean, they're way more fun. They're like, you know, community driven. We have this whole narrative. And the other piece of this is also gaming. I know uh, you've been exploring Axie Infinity this year to this whole play to earn gaming movement. It's kind of the same sort of idea. Well, I can play a game and have fun and also earn equity in the network. So can you talk about some of these examples you're seeing of, of the uh, Pareto frontier actually being applied? Yeah, so I think the promise of of play to earn gaming, obviously Axie Infinity, but there's you know uh, I think partially inspired by that and partially just inspired by the power of this model. There's a ton of other play to earn games coming out where, as you play, you're earning native tokens in the game, which gives you, to your point, a stake in the network itself. And so you're playing a game and building wealth by doing it. I do think that that does bring up an interesting point too, though, which is like it doesn't happen by default. And so actually in the beginning, you know, like Axie Infinity, uh, you know, said themselves when I talked to them for the piece that I wrote that, you know, like they need to make the game more fun over time. And so in the beginning, you really optimize for the financial piece. And so you go higher on the money scale because you know that it's lower on the fun scale. And ideally over time, you can make it so much fun that it's, wow, really cool that I'm making a little bit of money for also doing this thing that I like doing, uh, but that you need to kind of like play with those levers in, in the short term. So it, it is not that this automatically happens, but that you need to be aware that if you're not going to be fun, there better be money involved. And if there's <laughs> not going to be money involved, it better be really fun. That's a good point. I want to take this conversation actually outside of, of the crypto industry for a second, because there's something to compare it to with the the, re the rest of the world, the rest of the labor market. Something that we saw during COVID is a lot of people got laid off from their jobs. They, they got their stimmy checks. They got their unemployment money. Uh, and then getting these people back to work post COVID was really, really difficult. And it still remains difficult to this day. And all of a sudden, uh, labor has had an, uh, a tailwind to it because people are just less willing to do the things that they were doing previously. People are just fed up with their their trad job of just like going and, and working for, for low wages. And I'm wondering, Packy, if you could kind of just like comment on like how crypto is doing the expanding the Pareto frontier while the rest of society is more and more just fed up with their traditional trad job of just like grinding through for, for low wages. This can get, I think, super philosophical, right? Like there's Let's this Kurt it. Vonnegut book. Yes. Yeah. This Kurt Vonnegut book, Player Piano, um, where it's it, the, this world in the future where things have been automated. He wrote this in the 50s, but this world of the future where everything's been kind of like automated by these big machines that can do all of the jobs. And so the government hires people 
if you're not working on kind of building the machine or like being a manager at the place where the machine lives, they hire people to like dig holes in the road and then fill those holes back in and then dig holes in the road and fill the holes, those holes back in. And the point on it is that, you know, over time, like fewer and fewer and fewer jobs will be mission critical. So like human survival. Uh, and so we're going to need to figure out things that give people the things that work do like a sense of meaning and like an income um, so that people don't just go crazy and dig holes and fill them back in and dig holes and fill them back in over time. And so I think one of the interesting things is like, you know, when people are saying people say that you're just kind of like trading tokens against other tokens or flipping JPEGs or all of these things, like it, it gives people, I think, a sense of meaning and a sense of fun. And I think over the next hundred years, if you zoom out, jobs generally are going to become more fun because we won't need as many people or as, as big a percentage of the population doing things to keep humanity alive as more things get automated as technology gets better. Okay, so we've talked about all of the the virtues of Web3 and, um, you know, people listening to Bankless are probably pretty bullish on Web3, uh, as we are, of course, the three of us, but not everyone is in love with Web3, all right? And there's some criticism. And I think, like, there's some valid criticism of Web3 in its its kind of current state today. And then there's a lot of, like, irrational, invalid criticism that um, you know, certain politicians are, are putting forward or certain narrative drivers, people with, with large followings are putting forward for whatever reason. Maybe they're just like anti-Web3. Uh, maybe, maybe they didn't buy tokens. Who knows why they're upset about this thing. But can we talk about this Web3 debate? And you wrote a post on this entitled The Web3 Debate. And I think it was maybe kicked off in part by a tweet that went pretty viral from Jack Dorsey, who is, he's a Bitcoiner, a heavy Bitcoiner, but does not embrace Web3 at all. Uh, he said this, you don't own Web3. This is in December of last year. The web, the VCs and their LPs, their limited partners do, it will never escape their incentives. It's ultimately a centralized entity with a different label. Know what you're getting into. And of course, this caused a flurry of discussions. Uh, someone by the name of Professor G, who is kind of a, a writer in the space, summarized a whole bunch of criticisms against Web3. I'm wondering, Packy, if you could um, talk about that for, for, for a minute with us. So first, what are the criticisms that you generally hear about Web3 that people like Jack Dorsey and people like Professor G are uh, putting forward right now? Yeah, so I think the the big point that Jack was trying to make is that Web3 claims to be decentralized and that everybody owns, you know, the users own the projects and everybody wins in Web3, when really what's happening is that a bunch of VCs invested in the projects, they get tokens cheap, and then the token gets issued, they, they had warrants, the token gets, gets issued, they make a lot of money and they exert a huge amount of control over these networks. And so almost like the way that people got mad at kind of like all of the different female led companies that get taken down by business insider for like having this mission that people, you know, rally behind. And then maybe like not everything lives up to the mission. His point is like, we're rallying behind decentralization and distributed ownership and all of these things. But like, you know, the same couple of funds own big stakes in a bunch of the biggest projects. I am, you know, I've said before, not a, a full kind of decentralization maxi uh i mean there's there's certainly you know if, if projects are misleading uh their users and make it seem like you know there's not any vc money and that there's not any groups that own more than x percent but there actually are i think that's a bad thing but i don't the thing that that gets me i think about the vc ownership one and i wrote about this again when i wrote about flow a little bit is like dapper labs dies 50 times if if Union Square and Andreessen and a couple of other funds don't keep kind of stepping up to the plate to kind of get them from crypto kitties to developing their own blockchain to NBA Top Shot. And then finally they they took off. And two years after the first token warrant was issued, you know, uh they they did a public sale at the same price that the investors two years earlier had gotten their token warrants. And so even though Union Square and Andreessen own, you know, percentages of of flow. It is so totally different than a Twitter or a block, you know, Jack Dorsey's company's ownership structures would have been where it would have been just VCs for a very, very long time. And then uh, a public offering, which is sold to institutions and then sold to retail afterwards. So I think one of the ways that uh, Jack and even, you know, kind of Professor Galloway, this NYU marketing professor turned like just kind of 
bear on everything technology. One of the things that uh, they're using, I think, is just this trick of misdirection and kind of making the debate about is Web3 fully 100 percent, you know, fair launch decentralized versus is it better and more decentralized than the things that we have right now? Uh, and it loses just so many shades of nuance in in the middle. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with that take. And it's like one, one thing is like I've been an Uber user for for a long time. Right. And uh, I never got my uh, Uber airdrop. Right. I did get my Uniswap airdrop, though. And mm -hmm. so and so did uh, 120,000 other Ethereum addresses. Right. For you. It's like it's better than the status quo, obviously. And I think one of the the points that you make in, in the rebuttal section is you said this debate is not about whether Web3 or internet owned uh, by the users and builders uh, orchestrated with tokens is net good or net bad for humanity. Uh, not just as it stands today in its early its forms, but in the promise it holds, in the promise it holds for the future. And we see glimmers of it. And I, I feel like what you're saying is uh, many of the critics the kind of the common thread, a lot of the criticisms of Web three is like this, this purity standard that these they seem to hold crypto to, rather than just why not compare it to the status quo? We're, we're no one is saying crypto is perfect right now. We're not saying it's maximally decentralized. We're not saying it's, we we are actively saying, man, there's so much work we have to do to improve the user experience, to onboard more people, to make it more decentralized, to scale this thing out while preserving strong property rights and like we're working on it but like they seem to the many of the critics try to compare us to this like pure state as if we're saying yeah crypto is the best thing i was like totally perfect we have no more improvements to make now come hop in our system i think that's what you're saying here right it's exactly what i'm saying and the fact to, to your point that it's you know they're comparing this kind of like midway through kind of the yes. the the progress in the building to you know where it should be at some point in the future i think most of the people in the space would agree with what you just said and would agree that there's a ton more work and that we're not even close to the the end state of where this goes but like anything we're building and like in the beginning it's messy and it's actually harder to build this way and so it's going to be messier for longer i also love the time frames that people use are like well you know it's been 13 years since the white paper and so if this was ever going to happen it's you know it's the first internet you know like if you're comparing bitcoin to the internet like that's that's like arpanet you know like it took 40 years before there were like kind of real use cases after after that and people really like you know using the the internet at scale after that i think a more reasonable time frame is even just looking back to kind of you know the ethereum white paper uh, and so it's been less than a decade that people have been building apps on on in a decentralized it's, way it's it's also that that time frame is also hilarious to me because like literally we went from an industry worth zero dollars in terms of market assigned value which is the ultimate like long-term truth teller of what's valuable and it's the market we went from zero dollars to over two trillion dollars <laughs> in 13 years and you're saying ah, it's nothing no big deal. Like, where else have where you Where are the real that? use cases? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy well, to me. One thing that confuses me about Jack Dorsey's perspective is that he seems to judge Ethereum and, and Web3 on its current state, but he applies such a future premium to the current to the future state of Bitcoin. And that that discrepancy just confuses me so much. It's just like, wait, wait, wait. Why do you have so much promise for the future of Bitcoin, but you don't see any promise for the like you're judging Ethereum on its current state? And this mentality is rampant around so many just crypto critics. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I joked on I joked on Twitter that the reason Jack ended up leaving Twitter is because the engineers wouldn't build Blue Sky, their decentralized version of Twitter, on top of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> And so you had to go to Square, where at least you could just buy a bunch of Bitcoin and use that in the product. It, um, it, it is funny that after he left, they started rolling out like NFT features and the, these sorts features, of things. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I, and I, I, I guarantee you, I have no inside knowledge here. I guarantee you there were meetings where he was trying to get PMs and engineers to build NFTs and whatever else on Bitcoin. And they're like, you can't, you can't do that. That's not how this thing works. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think everybody... The thing that gets me about that and about, uh, you know, Professor Galloway kind of generally and just kind of the bears and the cynics generally is that everybody has their incentives. But by being the cynic, you look like the kind of smart, reasonable person, although you're just pumping your own bags in whatever way. Scott Galloway gets mad at things and gets eyeballs. 
Jack gets people to buy Bitcoin, which he's a huge believer in and holder of, and and uh, which you know Square is a big believer in and holder of, and it has as part of its its product. But you, you know, you look smart for being cynical, even though financially it's like way it would have been way 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 worse over the past decade. If the worst financial advice you could have given somebody over the past decade is to sit out of technology and to sit out of of crypto. But I, I don't know. It, it, that's my that's kind of my my soapbox is that. What what got me, and I, I don't like doing ad hominem stuff, but what got me to write a whole article on on one person's article that they wrote on their, their bearish take on Web3 is that there are hundreds of thousands of people out there who see this guy as an NYU marketing professor and somebody that they should trust who's out there using a soapbox, using misdirection to convince them of his perspective, and they just take it as gospel. And so now you have hundreds of thousands of people who might have been interested in Web3 who aren't going to be now and are going to miss out on kind of all the great things that we've talked about throughout this this episode. Full disclosure, Bankless has a bias too. We want you to go bankless. Full disclosure. <laughs> Packy, I want to actually uh, once again zoom out and kind of view this conversation from a bird's eye, a bird's eye view. There's a, there are a lot of other things to consider in this world as well. So, you know, it's, it's 2022. We've got a multi-chain, multi-layer two world. Everyone is building their own corner of the metaverse. Society is definitely moving to be far more digital than we ever thought that we would be probably at this point in time. Uh, meanwhile, there's like war in Eastern Europe, like countries, entire nations are becoming more distrustful with each other. Uh, and people are becoming kind of fed up with the current status quo. There's distrust in institutions. Uh, and, and so we have these two things in the background. We have crypto in the background. We got war in the background. Uh, there's got inflation going. How do you think, let's just, I just want to zoom out and just like wrap this all up. Like, how do you kind of expect the rest of the 2020s decade to more or less unfold as it relates to crypto, as it relates to Web3, but also as it relates to the demands that the physical world is is pushing upon society. How, how do you kind of just like interpret all of these things? Yeah, ETH to 50,000, at least. <laughs> Love it. Um, <laughs> you know, it would be what is by, you know, the, the end of decade price target. But I mean, the thing that I've been, I've been playing around with and haven't really written about, but is, is just this idea of kind of like the, the things that are going to matter over the next decade are almost these barbells, like the coolest possible things that you can do in the digital world. And then the coolest possible things that you can do in the physical world. Like, you know, there's been a, a big emphasis, you know, by Founders Fund and Lux and a few other funds over the past couple of years in defense tech and space tech and like all of this really hard, cool tech that is now kind of coming in vogue as there's, you know, been a war as SpaceX is bringing the launch costs down. So I think there's going to be all this really interesting stuff happening on in, in the world of atoms. And then obviously all the things that we've talked about kind of happening uh, in the world of bits and, and giving people ownership. And then over time, and it's probably starting to happen, you know, climate is probably the area where this is starting to happen the most, where digital and physical are starting to merge and you're aligning incentives using crypto that will hopefully help save the planet. I think over time, these two worlds of kind of bits and atoms are, are going to come together. Like We could colonize the moon by the end of the decade, right? And you're going to need to have new kind of economic and governance models. Each asteroid represents a possibility for someone to go set up their own government. Government, And so the fact that we're able to play with all of these economic and governance models in crypto and then apply them to, you know, space colonization. And, you know, I, I just think that that is so unbelievably cool. And so when people in hard tech you know, make fun of crypto or when people in crypto think that like th that's the only thing in the world i get asked all the time why i'm not just a web3 investor at this point like i think the really interesting stuff is going to happen at the intersection uh, of those worlds i can't i for one cannot wait for the first uh, initial asteroid offerings uh, to come out as, as you know tokenized asteroids um th that'll be a fun future um tacky <laughs> asteroids <laughs> this has been uh, such a cool conversation and it's really great to like I feel like when uh, I'm reading your, your post, as, as I said in the outset, this is like all about you know, part of your journey, part of kind of your research journey. I'm curious, where do you think your, your journey is going to take you next? And also like, how how does writing itself sort of inform how you invest and how you how you process, how you think about the world? I think uh, somebody, when we said we were having Packy on the show, said you should ask Packy how he became such a legendary writer. Can you just talk a little bit about your writing process? <laughs> Sure. I mean, I, I really do think that you identified, you know, to the extent that it resonates with people, I think it is because I am kind of very much learning at the same time. I think I'm in this like Goldilocks zone of intelligence where I'm like dumb enough to not understand things well enough just by like, you know, 
seeing them and and you know not having to like really think through and do a ton of research and like you know smart enough to actually be able to understand it if i put in a lot of work and so like just being in that middle spot and just like banging my head against the wall reading as much as i can asking people like you questions and like just trying to understand it myself and then just kind of like figuring out the way to translate what i've just learned into something that people might be able to understand uh has been i think hopefully the secret sauce of of not boring it really helps my my kind of thinking and my investing process because there are you know most of the pieces that i write i go into it with a blank page without an outline and just kind of like work my way through the idea so by the time i hit the end i have theses that i then go you know one i'm putting out a bat signal that i'm interested in these types of areas whenever i write about something so i'll see more companies like that and i'm mm. also a lot more prepared because i've talked to the smartest people that i possibly can and read the, the best things that i possibly can and so you know by the end of a piece i feel at least like reasonably competent uh, in understanding like what might be at play in a particular space and what's important and what's not important uh, and what resonates with people and what doesn't resonate with people. So it's it's all kind of like mixed in together for me, the writing and the investing and the conversations. And so I, I feel very lucky that this is what I get to do. That's really cool. I, I do think one of the most valuable things you can do as an investor in the space is of course, use these protocols for yourself, but also just write about them, create content about them. This is how you learn. This is how you educate yourself by educating others. Think out loud. Exactly. Um, Packy, thanks so much for joining us. And this has been very much a not boring podcast and we've appreciated <laughs> we you did it. all the way through. Yeah, we nailed this one. So we appreciate you spending time with us. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. Action items for you, Bankless Nation. We've got some resources in the show notes, as we always do. Action item number one, go check out some of the articles that we talked about. There's uh, five of them listed here. Ethereum, Solana, Status Monkeys, the Pareto Frontier, the Web3 Debate. You'll find them all in the show notes. Also, uh, Packy mentioned a book called uh, um, Piano Player. Uh, sorry, Player Piano. We're going to include that in the show notes, as we always do when a good book is mentioned. Finally, if you like the Bankless Podcast, get us to the top of the charts wherever you are subscribed, give us a five-star review. Tell us what you like about the podcast so we can climb up those rankings. Risks and disclaimers, guys, none of this has been financial advice. It never is. Bitcoin is risky. So is ETH. So is all of DeFi. You could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.